Die Kia I just thought I'd like to start with my introduction with our PPR, and uh, PPR is often the landmarks that I'm associated with as a tangata whenua. The whenua that we talk about starts with our mountain, and our mountain is called Mangaraki, and Mangaraki is a mountain range to the east. Uh, most people in the Wairarapa Valley think that the sea starts on the other side, but there's about seven or eight more ranges before the sea starts. But Mangaraki is the body of a tanifa. So my nanny used to talk to us about all the stories around Hiranua Rangi Amarai. Part of that was Mangaraki. And my mum, who's a little too imaginative, always thought that a hill looked like the body of the tanifa with its ridges and its uh, being the limbs and its backbone going across the range. To be fair, we used to stop there because my grandfather, who we call Popo, his van used to kind of overheat by the time it got to the top of the hill. And so we would have to pull over and put some water in the radiator there. Our awa is where we played in the summer, and that was in the Romahanga River. And then our moana is Swaradapa because that's uh, one what our province is known for. It's a pretty outstanding land feature. And then actually being a little more intimate about land, our marae atia, our land that we value perhaps the most is at Hiranui Orangi. Where our marae is and where my nanny's marae is. My papa's marae was at Te Whiti. That's a little bit about the whenua that I come with and might not speak as much as I do about people. I'm looking forward to making sure that our land is represented as well. Its relevance to the Wairapa is uh, is somewhat different and exclusive to the Wairapa. The treaty itself was composed and put together in the far north and it was done quite hurriedly, in fact. A number of the local Amatu uh, Rangatira had agreed with it and had signed it. And from then on, the Tariki itself was taken round the country uh, for a local all, uh, Rangatira to sign. It's my understanding that it was not actually signed by the people of the Wairapa. It was bloodless, but we were one of the first regions to be impoverished under new legislation. By 1856, we had 60% of our land gone. Right. They'd only signed the treaty in 1840 when we were still 150,000 to their 2,000 living in this country. And in 16 years, 60% of our land under new legislation wiped away with a slice of a pen. And we established our own government, which was the biggest colony of Māori in the country at the time because they'd wiped everybody else out. They'd split up the kingitanga, taken the lands in the king country, sent them hiding in the bush with Maniaputu and Tuwharetua. They'd taken the land from Tuhoi, sent them hiding in the, in the bush, in the Uruwera, where they took all the good farmland all the way around Whakatane, everywhere, everywhere. So all of our biggest settlements were decimated by land loss and battles with the colonising government. But here, it was taken under a swipe of a pen. If you don't live on it, it's not yours. That's why there's no rates on the seven acres around your marae, because that's the only land you were allowed. Seven acres around a dwelling. No, just your biggest dwelling. That's all, that's yours, everything else is unoccupied and now we own it. And we had a settler economy. We welcomed them in. We were thriving and prosperous people who ruled the economic drivers in the region. Um, Te Reo Māori was the language of trade and settlement, and it was local governments when Gray changed the legislation that took all the leases and said it's illegal now to pay your land leases to the Māori that you're leasing from. 
have to pay it to the hierarchy of kingdoms and <laughs> and fiefdoms and priesthoods. I grew up over in Cameron Block and um, we played in the back where the netball courts are now and it was um, the remnants of the old stockades that we used to have in the day. And I remember asking mum what the concrete jungle was over there that we played in for so many years and she told me then that it was part of a stockade that was in our town to keep the Māoris from going to town. They had to stay on this side of the, I don't know how long ago it was. I envisaged it was like in the 60s, but it was possibly the late 1800s or something that they'd stopped. those stockades were up, specifically to keep Māori from uh, entering the town. So I grew up over there playing in those places and knowing that that was my little patch. I feel like I'm part of the generation that um, that got the backlash from the treaty. Um, we were all just moaners and... Uh, you know, share the land and what are you moaning about? And, you know, if it wasn't for colonisation, we'd be in a worse spot. Um, my dad got told in the late or maybe early 60s um, that the whare he was living in now, Te Whiti here, just down the road, um, this this area here is Mangaokuta, um, and my dad used to live down the road in their house and then when I got, they got told that they were unhygienic so they had to move to town. So the move to Cameron Block was orchestrated, it was prepared and for, for our people and um, my dad didn't like it and he didn't like it right up till the day he died in 1999. He struggled with the move to town. When we lose the majority of our land faster than anyone in the country, we become impoverished. It has had an effect in the, in the ignoring of it. The effect on our people has been a division down the middle of Masterton Township. And if you came into Wadarapa and went to go buy a house, everyone would advise you not to do that on the east side, where um, they literally took all the topsoil when they made the little block reservation and took that up to the Lansdowne Golf Course for their beautiful greens and their fairways. And now people have been carving out, trying to grow gardens at the back of their properties where they were um, huddled into an area after, you know, urban drift and attracting you off the farm and everywhere else. And so um, they try and grow marakai on that place. The effect that I see on our people here is the ignoring of the treaty the ignoring of our people in decision making, all the way to the top tables that embed um, injustice and inequity amongst our people. You have to have targeted responses for our whanau if you're going to lift them out of the cultivated poverty that you put them in. You did it deliberately. You have to undo it deliberately. One of the first things to do is is to learn about the treaty. You know, you, it's hard to fuck up something if you don't know anything about it. Even though some people often talk about, you know, this happened and this happened and this was taken and this all that sort of stuff. Because we have to learn all those things. We have to go through that process of, of learning what we say, ngā piki me ngā heke, which kind of translated means the, the good and the bad had to go through that process of understanding what that history was, but also why, why things happened as they did. In the why, you sort of start to see, well, taking those explanations and those understandings will help us moving forward in terms of all of those things we just talked about and developing our identity. The treaty can help us do that. I feel like we all need to understand the document, especially those in powers, because they make a lot of decisions around here and 
I feel like if they don't actually know what we're meant to be doing and how things are meant to be going, then it's not going to make a positive change for our community. We could put a bit more money into it if we just make it an own thing, make it a bigger thing than what it is now. One of the things that I think about is that rather than having the ideas that might have happened in the 50s and 60s where uh, Māori were uh, looking to assimilate uh, with uh, Pākehā culture, where um, our success was how we could succeed in the Pākehā world by looking Māori but being Pākehā. There was an idea under that kind of concept that um, the things that we had as as Māori weren't worth as much as the things that we could have gained by um, accommodating assimilation. So, you know, sometimes Māori aren't seen as business people. Um, but my uncle, uh, Lawrence, had um, eight sharing bands, uh, was one of the biggest contractors and mastered a new business back to front. Well, I was going to say despite disadvantages, but I, to be fair to my Uncle Lawrence, I just never saw those disadvantages. I didn't think he made uh, the most out of, uh, one, his relationships, and two, the way that he did business. And so it's, um, while sharing is a wired up, I think, um, I think that the Wairarapa Māori have been underappreciated for their contribution in Wairarapa. I put business because sometimes uh, that's a very a, a huge difference. And the reality is actually Māori went and loud in the economy. And so uh, a whole range of the taking of lands meant that we were out, outside of the economy that existed for the rest of New Zealand. Um, and so um, there's a stark difference there. If there's another difference, um, it might be an educational achievement. So rather than go through the liabilities and say, well, this is uh, the achievement levels and here are the markers, etc. I, I do want to go to the asset. And so... Um, you know, I know that it was the hope of my great-grandparents and our grandparents that we would have that uh, wired up a nature about who we were. So what does the treaty mean? Imagine if we stood up and said, uh, this is who we can be. Oh,